What cocktail combines three days of activities, collaborations, guest shifts, and seminars in Barcelona and bar industry legends from some of the most famous bars in the world with one serious message? That would be the Paradiso Sustainability Summit 2023. I'm Susan Schwartz, your drinking companion, and this is Lush Life Podcast. Every week, we are inspired to live life one cocktail at a time. On the 21st through the 23rd of March, I was fortunate to attend the second edition of the Paradiso Sustainability Summit, organized by Giacomo Gianotti and his team, in partnership with Kettle One Vodka through their Garnished with Good program. For those who might not know, Giacomo's Bar Paradiso was ranked best cocktail bar in the world for the world's 50 best bars 2022. And this summit was established as an exchange of ideas and tools with the aim of raising awareness and making the industry more sustainable. Also speaking at the summit and joining us today on Lush Life is not only Giacomo, but also Matthew Dale from Rhee in Sydney, Agung and Laura Prabo and San Dakal from Penicillin in Hong Kong, Paul Vota from Himcook in Oslo, Tato Giovannoni from Floridia Atlantico in Buenos Aires, Alex Francis from Little Red Door in Paris, and Dennis Thompson from Kettle One. It was truly an eye-opening event, and it inspired me to do so much more to be sustainable. Up first is, of course, Giacomo, our host and founder of this important initiative. Okay, so I'm Giacomo Giannotti, co-owner and founder of Paradiso. We are in in Barcelona, in Paradiso, and we are here for the occasion of the Sustainability Summit of Paradiso 2023. We are here in March with, you know, a lot of international guests. We have five uh, like bar speaker Ray Floreria Atlantico Little Door uh, Penicillin uh, and uh, Incoc Now this is the second year that yes. you've had it so tell yes. me about the first year and maybe your concept of why you even started it in the first place The the first year yes the concept um, it was um, to do like a summit so like a meeting with other colleagues other people uh, from different parts of the world and uh, then for for us uh, are like a font of inspiration leaders in sustainability to host them and together like uh, give our point of view on the sustainability share our stories our technique our approach to it and try to share it to inspire other people to share the message so this is the main goal of the, the sustainability summit and last year uh, it was already a very big success even we saw today the room was full, packed, so it's, it's growing a lot. Last year's there were three bars. It was Alchimico from Cartagena. It was VJ from Analog and Native from Singapore. It was Anna Sebastian from, from London. And in the last day, it appeared as well Alex from Little Red Door, and he, he bring as well his point of view. It was smaller. We just did like a, two seminar and one like round table with everybody like sharing our point of view. So this year it was like six seminars, you know, three days of activity, five guest bartending. So it was like, you know, more, more activation, more people invite. So, and the presentation of the Waste Lab last year. The Waste Lab is actually a project and we are on since three years. Let's say we wanted to present last year's, but for permission for the machine for different reason we couldn't do it so we just presented like on a presentation and i'm happy this year to present this physically okay we'll talk about the waste lab in a minute but back to the bartenders who are invited both or and the bars that were involved should i say both last time last year and this year did you choose them because you saw that they were doing something in sustainability that may not have been talked about or, you know, tell me your process in choosing why those people and why last year came and these this year as well. For me, they are all different in the approach of the sustainability, our leader in what they do it. And because I think like 
everybody is different, you know, in operation. Even if some, they have some common point, but then as the concept is different, country law are different. So the idea as well is the summit is to bring people from different country where they approach in sustainability, where their own idea on different style, but with the, let's say with the common sense, with the, with the sense of common, not to try to respect the environment, ourselves, people, ingredients we, we work with. So this is, this is how I choose because I think these five bar, these five team, they do something amazing on their own ideas, you know. And when you did it last year, was there something that was eye-opening to you that you thought, I need to implement that right now that you may have learned from the other bars that spoke? Yes, a lot. I mean, like last year's, like these years as well, I listened to the seminar very, very carefully because all the work of the guys doing is amazing. Like when Tato was talking, I had the luck to be in Argentina in August last year and I saw with my eye the project of uh, Apostoles, you know, mm-hmm. and I saw the community of people they work with, he want to preserve. So uh, I think the work of Little Redar, all the work of, of anyone is amazing. And we try to, you know, to learn and inspire from each other. One thing that I think I came in with the assumption was that sustainability <clears throat> was you know, everything that you do after. So, you know, pro- making sure you're recycling. And what I've learned is that, you know, the sustainability, like you're talking about, uh, Floreria, that it's more community. Mm-hmm. You know, they're, you know, making sure that the people around them are doing as well as they are. And that, I think, is something that I never really thought of. What I was struck by was when Agong, from penicillin said that a lot of people who come to the bar say you've you know i'm spending so much money on a cocktail why are you using waste materials to make it and that is like so foreign have you ever experienced that like you know these, <clears throat> these are kind of crazy mindsets yes. you know it's so hard to, this, this is, yes, to change is, people's mind yes. about what sustainability really is this is the, the goal of the, the summit is like a bring to the table different experience and idea and sustainability is means so many things you know from recycling from farm to glass help the community you know so i think like every aspect is is important will be like i don't know my dream i think the dream of everybody if you could do like everything, you know, like help the community, recycling, work very close with farmers, you know. So, but I think like as our project is like being step by step and doing, you know, something improving through the year, a different, different aspect, you know. So I think we have so much to learn. I'm great. These guys, they, they did this masterclass because, you know, as we were saying before, they open our eyes and they, they make us better, you know, in the end of the day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Just about your lab, the Zero Waste Lab, which, yeah. you know, opened while we were here, yeah. which is so exciting. Tell me about the concept of that and why you created it and what your projections are for it in the future. So the lab, the, the goal of the lab is uh, to have like a team then can work uh, with, let's say, with all the aspects of the sustainability. So a team then needs to study research, uh, study the bar, study the methodology of the bar, analyze the waste, uh, or as well analyze the product that we buy and try to make better and better our daily work and bring uh, Paradiso like as a model, as a a bar with the less waste possible, okay, or less uh, footprint possible. So that's the main goal. We needed to start, okay? So after many years, finally, we see the project on light. It's a place right now. It's more like a kind of art gallery lab where we expose from yesterday all the work that we've been doing in the last few years. So there are all our projects related to sustainability. So, and there is like a, a really lab because there is a machine. So we have there five machines that help us to recycle and reuse the plastic of the bar into new tools and material or merchandising object that we can 
actually give it for free or for present or sell it to the people. There are like all the projects we did with upcycling the glass bottle in glass, in, in water jar. There is uh, exposed there the um, compost. Then we remake it out of our organic waste. So all the projects that we have done, there are exposed there, is in front of the bar. And a part of working every day is as well showing to our customers, to the people, making people conscious of you know what we can do instead of throwing away or you know reuse all the ingredients so it's it's like a, a place with a lot of different discipline and it's incredible because i never knew that something could be made out of the muscle shells yeah. and so beautiful and the art and the plastic it's it's really incredible so what do you foresee for this next year and maybe doing it are you going to be doing it again next year yes i think so because <laughs> It's, it's, it's going so well, you know, I'm enjoying so much and I see a lot of response as well from everybody, from the people of the city, the bartenders, the, the media, the, us bartenders, we talk, we, we share, so very good energy and, uh, you know, this, this gives you the power to, to do it and, you know, with the summit is as well for us in Paradiso, is a part for us to, to grow to be better, to push, you know, ourselves. So from this summit, we learn a lot and we'll try in our style to improve these uh, things and we learn. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate thank it. You. It's been fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now we hear from Matt Dale of Rebar in Sydney. Opened in 2021, Re's mission is to be a completely no-waste bar. Among so many things, they only use produce that would otherwise head to landfill. But there's so much more they're doing, so I'll let Matt tell you everything. My name is Matt Dale. I'm the venue manager of Rebar in Sydney, Australia. Currently here in Paradiso, Barcelona, part of their Sustainability Summit for 2023. Super excited to be invited here by Jacques Mo and the team to kind of showcase our way of sustainability within Re because we you know we do things differently to a lot of bars and we're here to teach other bars and other bartenders and also the public about ways that they can tackle food waste and climate change around the world. Now mm. can you just give us a little taste of what makes you different or what you do specifically at Re? Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So the venue itself is 100% being recycled. And the tables, the floor, the chairs, uh, the glassware has all been recycled. And the cocktails and food are actually made from waste ingredients. So we work with other venues, farmers, as well as, you know, just butcheries and, and your bakeries. And they give us their their offcuts or their, their byproducts, their the things that they're just not using anymore. And then we make cocktails and food out. Um, which is a lot different to to many other bars, I think, around the world, especially ones that are, are sustainably focused as well, because there are just different types of sustainable. Can you give an example of maybe one product or food that you used in a cocktail that you created out of it? Absolutely. We had a cocktail, and I think this one took a lot of people by surprise, is that uh, we worked with a, a local restaurant called St. Peter. And Josh Nyland is probably one of, uh, to be honest, in our He's the best fish seafood chef in the world. His restaurant's incredible. He's also very, he's very mindful about how much waste he creates in his own restaurant. So he actually uses pretty much everything you can out of, out of you know, any seafood dish. We took fat from a Murray codfish and we ended up fat washing rum with that particular cod fat. Very textural a nice minerality to it but it also it was very delicate and, and quite a, a nice touch to the rum which then was built together in a in a kind of martini s style drink when you say it's very textural what did what does that mean like because you adds, think you fish and rum it was like well, yeah that's gonna be it adds a nice like um, mouthfeel on, okay. on your palate it's 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 got more you know it's just a clean like a clean spirit it has been it's it's been developed. It has another layer of flavor, reminding us, and it just kind of rounds out the palate. It's quite nice. 
And so when you took the rum, I'm sorry, what, what was the cocktail that you made from that? So the drink was called St. Peter. So there was a, a time where all of our cocktails were named after the venue or the person or the farm okay. that we grabbed waste from. Um, so the St. Peter was a Murray Cod Fat rum with Katsuboshi. Katsuboshi is Bonito Flakes. So we distilled yeah. the Bonito Flakes, the spirit. Uh, and we ended up using mango and ocean honey as well. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. Yeah. So the ocean honey was a mixture of using seaweed as well as uh, honey and blitzing it together to create a much more rounded flavor. What do you see kind of for the future of your bar? You know, you put all this effort into setting it up yeah. and it, it's been a few years since it opened. Yeah. What do you see as the future? We're continuously developing what we do at Re, We've moved on from kind of branching out to a lot of venues and grabbing their waste. We're now looking at our own waste within our venue mm -hmm. and restricting of what we do. So we've now come up with what we're calling our 10 by 10 menu. And we are now using the 10 most wasted items in the world and then creating a pantry from those ingredients only. So we end up actually creating a hundred ingredients. And for the future of Re, that is the only ingredients we're allowed to now use in Re itself. We can use base spirits, and then we can use like the basic sugar, salt, and acids. But otherwise, any cocktail from, from the future now has to be only used those ingredients, those pantries. As I said, you put so much effort into this, and this is your way of working. Do you demand the same for the spirit that you work with? We're pretty thankful that there are a lot of open-minded brands out there pushing more into sustainability. Kittle One, obviously, has a huge community impact, which is amazing. Brands like Johnny Walker as well, Florida Kanya, as well as a whole bunch of also local Australian brands as well. A lot of Australians, especially in, in the spirit industry, are pushing for sustainability in their own practices. Everyone's getting inspired by that and doing their own way of sustainability in Australia in this experience, which is great because it means that, you know, we can use local stuff. We can reach out and be like, hey, your spirit is amazing. We know it's sustainably focused. Last but not least, I always ask for my top tip for the home bartender. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell the home bartender if they want to be sustainable. Yeah. Kind of what would your be your top tip for them? Yeah, compost bin. Because not only... Really you, you can compost your bar ingredients that you're using at home, but also your cooking as well. For us, uh, doing that is, is, you know, we have a compost. And, and for us, it's, it's probably the, the most important thing. Minimize what you're using as well. Don't just go out and buy one ingredient just to, to make one drink and then discard it. Do more with that ingredient. You know, use it in different cocktails. Use it in, in food items as well. You can do a lot just say a lot. Well, thank you. This is great. Okay. I really so appreciate much. it. Penicillin is Hong Kong's first sustainable bar. For owners of Gong and Laura Prabo, plus San Dakal, their sustainability and operations manager, this means using local ingredients and recycling and upcycling and the incorporation of a stinky room. What's that? I'll let them tell you. My name is Agung Prabowo from Penicillin Bar in Hong Kong. My name is uh, Laura Prabowo, also from Penicillin and Dead End Bar in Hong Kong. My name is uh, San Dakal. I'm also from Hong Kong, Penicillin Bar. Great. Now tell me what you're doing at this wonderful sustainability summit. All right. So we are thank uh, full enough that the Giacomo uh, Paradiso team inviting us to be one of the team member of the uh, sustainability summit. 2023. So we are here to share about what we are, who we are, about what we do in Penicillin Bar in Hong Kong. A penicillin Bar is the first sustainable concept bar in Hong Kong. We are open like two years ago during the pandemic. We are doing closed loop cycle. We're using all the ingredients to the fullest, minimizing the waste for sure. We are doing the recycle and upcycle at the same time. So this recycled product, upcycled products, we send it back to the kitchen, to the bar, and we reuse it for the next ingredient of the cocktail, 
uh, the food, like glaze, some sauce, you know, some hand, hand sanitizer. Like yeah, we like, make, we, we, we make a lot of things from the leftover. Yeah. Basically. Mm -hmm. so we have like four chamber elements in our place, which is the laboratory. We have main bar, the kitchen, and then the stinky room, which is a, fermenta a fermentation room. So these four chamber elements helping us to do the recycle, upcycle. Yeah. So just for instance, that a lot of, a lot of bartenders squeezing the lemon or lime, you know, we collect the juice. So we're thinking about how you, we use the pulp, the seeds, the skin, you know, etc. Mm -hmm. So we can send it back to the lab. We're making the hand sanitizer or we send it to our fermentation room. We might you use the skin for, you know, we make a oleosaccharum. Or we are doing some kombucha, like this kind of thing. So that's actually a very small example that uh -huh. we do. But of course, we have a lot of ingredients to, to play around to do the recycle and cycle. Well, I tried one of your delicious cocktails here, the yeah. homemade apple cider. Mm -hmm. Can you talk me how through how that, that kind of process to make it? What were the different ingredients and what might have been recycled? Okay, yes. <laughs> and then explain this one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, apple yeah. pulp, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, basically, uh, like there are bars around who use a lot of apple juice. And even we use by ourselves in some of the cocktails. Then we have leftover apple pulp while juicing and also uh, pineapple rings, all those things. And then it comes to our closed loop cycle concept. So we want to ferment it, creating apple cider. So in those apple pulp and then pineapple rings, we add like a spice honey and then we just ferment it. It's just traditional way of fermenting using some yeast and by the end, like around seven days when we ferment it. And then we got the fermentation by adding a distillate of a guava with vodka or sometimes gin. That's why you can get those guava taste also in that drink. So the whole process is just about using one of the major chamber elements, which is stinky room and like fermenting the things. We have like many ingredients going through that process actually. We make a study we were showing in the slide as well. We make like red cabbage, passion fruit, and then also like rosé wine, like those kind of things. Right, right. Now, you've been around for a long time. You have gotten very famous. What do you see as the future or what are your next steps to becoming even more sustainable in the bar? I think to become more sustainable, sustainability is now like very a trend in, in terms of words. Like everybody try to... What's, what's what you call it? So like following the trend of sustainability, like, but maybe not all the people know the real meaning of sustainability. That's why like from us in penicillin, we want to do it in a fun way. So we want to give the message in a very short way, but in a fun way, we want to inspire people like with what we are doing by giving them the message, like just do just small thing. Start from, from, from yourself. Like when you go to supermarket, you bring your own bag. And then in the future, we have a plan to get more tools maybe in our bar to make something like what Paradiso did. So it inspired us a lot, basically. So we can play around with all the leftover plastic more. We get inspired so much today with what Paradiso did. So in the future, penicillin, I think we would like to do something like that in a small scoop. Yeah, because Hong Kong is very small. We don't have like a big clan. <laughs> but to add on, the sustainability is not only just a trend. I think it's in the way that all the bartender naturally will do sustainability, meaning that they will more conscious about like about the ways, you know, about how they are recycling, how they are not like using the plastic behind the bar. So yes, in the coming five years, 10 years, sustainability is a part of the mixologist or bartender or the bar. So you don't have to show them or remind them, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be like naturally, automatically, you know, sustainably in, in their DNA while they're creating the cocktail. Fabulous. Now, mm. I always ask for the top tip for the home bartender. And I would love to know what your top tip for the home bartender is to be more sustainable while they're making drinks. Uh, I think for me, for me, for me first, like uh, for each bartender, my tip is just like always think before you throw in a bit, like uh, what you can do with your 
you know, like ingredients. In, in ingre ingredients, whatever you have, what you can do with that ingredients, like before you throw it in a bit. And that is okay. Just to add on the same thing, actually, watch your surroundings. We have a lot of things actually in our kitchens. That's kind of habit to every single person. If there is something left over for three days, we just want to throw it. That's automatically comes up. So those kind of thing we can easily convert to a drink. Yeah. Okay. So we're always watching uh, in your kitchen. That will be a great tip. Yeah. I guess almost the same for home uh, bartender. Never stop to be creative. I know it's a home with the very limited ingredient. But I guess, you know, there is a small piece of ingredient or small piece of fruit, vegetable, some leaf, you know, you can turn into the cocktail, basically, you know, it's all about try and error. You know, there is no right or wrong to creating the cocktail. It's the, it's a matter of like, you willing to do it or no. Fabulous. Well, thank right. you so much. This no, is thank, great. You. Thank, thank you. you. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oslo, Norway's hymn cook is truly an institution. Within its bar, it houses a distillery making aquavit, gin, and vodka, plus so many other spaces to discover all within its one complex. Paul Votza, Head of Research and Development, joins me to explain what sustainability means to them. My name is Paul, and I work at the bar uh, of Cook, and we flew over for the Sustainability Summit at Paradiso. We mainly talked about how Cook tackles the sustainability in a financial way, waste way as well and also in the human way i mean for us sustainability in norway is kind of like goes hand to hand with our values in norway we've always recycled i know since little they teach kids to recycle plastic goes with plastic produce goes with produce and paper paper glass with glass aluminium with aluminium to, to, for us it's absolutely normal it's part of the country's core values i would say and we try to do the same not by accident or not by we're not forced to do it but we just do it because I mean, it's, it's just nat natural. I, would say. I guess one could get lazy and be like, okay, we're already doing this stuff. Like, we don't need to do any more. Like, what, um, in addition to all that, what do you feel is sustainability for Himcock? I would say uh, the most important thing is like, since Himcock opened, we try to source everything locally. That's like a must. And when we when we see there's a problem inside the bar, like five years ago, I mean, we, we, we made whiskey sours, Moscow meals, you know, the crowd pleasers for a high volume bar. And the high volume bar is one of the most important bars inside our bar <laughs> because that's where we generate the most capital with the least amount of people. That's what keeps us like eating and investing into other things. So what we used to do is uh, we used to squeeze every week about 60 liters of lemon juice, 40 liters of lime. And the amount of trash, this is weekly. So at the end of the year, like it was tons. We were throwing out tons of lemon and lime peel and it just absolutely made no sense. So we pivoted to that. It's a long process and it takes also financial backup to actually reach out to the best laboratories that are in Europe, best flavor houses to actually develop a compound from zero and add it into a final product that is shelf stable. So that for us, it was like a problem that we had to solve and we did it in that way. And now we produce these cocktails in a brewery and we make them in 5,000, 10,000, 50,000 liters. And we also distribute to our sister bars and to other bars also around the town. So that, that for us, it's a successful way to implement sustainability financially and also ecologically because we're not throwing all this waste. And also it's super hard to compost lime and lemon. It has to be done in a very special way. Also, 65% uh, of the spirits are used are made in house, so that's that's really good. And now we want to be higher, higher with that. So we have our, our owner Eric has invested up north, and we're going to do a whiskey distillery. So mm -hmm. in we, I mean sustainability, we don't look at a yearly thing. We we project like in three years, four years, because we will, hopefully the bar will still be open by then. It's a long term project. So in three years, Himcook will have its own whiskey and we'll be at 85% of the in-house. So this is our projects. When we see a problem, we try to tackle it and see how we can improve and hopefully it impacts the human way, the economical, financial way, which is super important. And also, yeah, the, the trash, the waste that we generate. Fabulous. Now, other than the whiskey distillery, what are the future sustainability goals that you have? So <clears throat> I think by now, like the bar is seven years old. That's pretty stable. We know how to make, make liquid 
like uh, hopefully you can taste our cocktails tonight. It, it's it's not a problem. What we're trying to teach our bartenders now that we're really focusing on that is to take an approach that it's not only about the liquid. We want to kind of like uh, we break the bartender at one point. Like in, in him cook, a person start always no matter what as a bar back, then becomes a waiter, then becomes a tap tail bartender, then it becomes hopefully a, C, a junior bartender in the in the distillery bar, and then we're gonna take him. When he becomes senior, we're gonna teach him the whole 360 core business because it's important because you can't just stay a bartender your whole life, technically, at the end of the day. It's, you know, it's to, it requires a lot of physical, mental energy. So we teach him the whole like 360 business approach or how we make things, how we see things. Because I mean, the drinks is for, for me, I always see the drink as like 10% of our core business. I want to teach our bartenders how to break away from this or the bottles the liquid, the cocktails, and teach like the financial side, which is actually I think more the most important one. Like how they can build careers, like after they leave him cook and polish those skills and move on. At the end of the day, I think that's 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 sustainable. That's investing in people. We're investing in people. Absolutely. That, that, that's what that's what we do. We invest in people. We invest in projects. We invest in all our collaborations. Like I said, that uh, we <laughs> when him cook opened seven years ago. We only had ciders from Portland. Now we only invite local ciders. Things like this, small stuff, collaborations, and eventually yeah, teach our bartenders that there's more than just the drink. It's a whole business. Talking about the ciders, were the cider producers always there? Or do you think in the seven years, just it's become more people are creating distilled spirits, ciders, things like that, and that that's why you found them is because they were growing with you? They were growing with us. It was actually quite like, let's say, Norway is usually this is what we see. Nor- Norway is a little bit like in the trends from the United States. We're like five years behind. So when that started booming and then him cook open, then we saw like, okay, everybody's now making microbreweries. Everybody like we have amazing apples, amazing plums. A lot of people were making like fruit wines. So they grew up, they grew with us. And then we started tasting. We have a fantastic cider called uh, from Harlinger Alde. He he makes great, really good stuff. And now this guy actually, since he's doing so well, he's working with other other communities and creating even a bigger kind of like collaboration with other producers. And they're also starting to make their own ciders. So that's really really cool to to see, to be honest. Like in the menu now as well, we have a lady from Stavanger. She she makes ice cream. And for the past three menus, we've been using her ice cream, and it's really, really good product. And now she's like, she's been working with us. She's reaching the global finals in gelato, CD's ice cream. So she, and she's super happy, and we, like we support that, like always uh, collaborate, like sustainability and collaborations. Like I think that's great. Hand in hand. Now I always ask for my top tip for the home bartender. So what would you suggest for the home bartender to be a little bit more sustainable? What would your, be your suggestion? I would say uh, keep it simple three ingredients max hopefully choose local stuff like right now like you can see a huge trend in like low ABV cocktails so I would say just grab spirit and dilute it with I don't know like your local cider your local brewery Uh, we've made great cocktails with only three ingredients and nothing fancy nothing complicated if you have a particular flavor that you like just try to focus on that flavor and try to make something really simple with it and add it to to the spirits fantastic thank you so much If you're in Buenos Aires and looking for a cocktail, there is no excuse not to head to Tato Giovannoni's Floreria Atlantico. Not only because their mission is to work with rural Argentinian communities, but their cocktails are fantastic. Tato is with me to explain how this work began. I'm Tato Giovannoni. I'm from Argentina. I'm a bartender myself. I've been in this industry for like 30, more than 30 years. I own a bar in Buenos Aires called Floreria Atlantico, which basically tells the story about Argentina through the immigration that came to the country in the beginning of 1900. Great. And tell me a little bit about what you were doing at the Paradiso Sustainability Summit. We were invited by Giacomo and Margarita to be part of this amazing, beautiful festival talking about sustainability. And the idea, even though we could focus only talking about what we do in the bar, I own, also own a distillery and I produce spirits for more than 10 years now. And I brought with myself, Juani, who's in charge of the producers and the research of the botanicals all around Argentina and Chris Stewart, 
who's our master distiller. So the idea was to showcase a little bit of what we do through the bar and through the spirits that we produce and how we work in a sustainable way with humans, no? Because that's um, something that we, sometimes we don't talk. We talk about the paper, we talk about the straws, we talk about the plastic, but sometimes we forget about how many people are involved be behind spirits in the production of the spirits and how you can build a spirit company being sustainable and at the same time in an industry that we basically use spirits or liquors, we keep on talking about the sustainability and reusing citruses or re reusing fruits, and but we barely focus our eyes in the industry that we use most, which is spirits and why, I mean, how you can grow being sustainable, how, how far you can go uh, how, when you, you will have to stop producing or the way that you produce and the way that you basically, the way that you relate to the producers and all the families that are behind of what at the end of the day is one bottle. And at the end of the day, that bottle in a bar mixed with some other bottles, which has some other people behind and with some fruits and vegetables that the families behind that, and they end up also in one glass. And we sit at the bar, we just order a drink as a guest or a customer. We sit, we order a drink, and we almost never think about all that. How many hens, how many families, how many years of cultivation, how the tradition of those things end up being in a glass. Can you give an example of one specifically? Yeah, for example, I mean, when I, when I'm, we were talking also about this, uh, it's a, a goal that you have in your life when you build something because you always have a dream or a goal and you know you're going to start it. It's almost impossible always to, to achieve your goal as soon as you build your dream. You know, that dream, it, it, it needs to keep on growing and you need to keep on going forward to that, that, that final goal, which is the more complex than opening a bar. My dream was to open a bar and slowly start finding producers from Argentina, hoping that more people will start distilling. Uh, and at the same time, I, I start my distilling company and producing spirits. The first one was a gin uh, called Principe de los Apostoles. And of course, at the beginning, my goal was to have our own producers and our own families and people that we can build a relationship for years, knowing this person is going to plant the yerba mate or the mate tea for our spirit. It took me, we have 10, 11 years now of history in Apostolis. It took us eight years to achieve that. You know, sometimes in the, in the way it's easy to get lost because we sell a lot of gin and we didn't have any, no one knocking at the door saying, Tato, you need to do, or you need to know where they, pro they produce it. They produce it organically. You, you need to build up a relationship with the family. You need, nobody is going to ask you that, no. but it's something that is inside of us. And that's the way we like to do things. And I believe that is a very sustainable thing of doing. And the same with the bar. We have Juan traveling the entire country and finding someone to do a plantation for us, which is not our plantation, it's their own plantation of something that is not going to be bought also because it's, then again, it's not sustainable. If I buy cherries from one producer only three months a year, and then I don't buy anything else for 10 years because I, I'm not building any relationship and I'm not supporting that family and I'm not. So we think in a long-term relationship. So we try to find those producers or people that they can allow us to have uh, products all year round. One thing that I didn't say in the presentation because it was quite long, we were three people talking, mm -hmm. it was in the past years, we barely use any fresh fruits in Trudea, but because we relate to families that they collect their either vegetables or roots or, or bushes and we dry them and we keep it and we can use it all year round. And they, it's also easy for them to collect it when they're fresh, dry it in their own houses and they can sell it to us in different periods of the, of the year. So we, of course we use lemon orange for the classics, but most of the, our signature drinks are made with uh, dry botanicals. Now, you talked about the tea that goes into your gin. Just to use that as an example, you said it took you for eight years, you were doing it the same way. 
how did you find the farmer or what triggered that change to then say, okay, it's time. We found it. You know, this is, this is the right tea for us. It's, um, I mean, the, the journey was big, uh, long because we started a company with uh, almost no money and, and build it really slow. We were only three people working at the company, me and my partner and my two partners. One doing exports and the other one doing uh, sales and me doing the, the creativity side and the blends and the distillation. But that idea was since the beginning. And, and the thing is being so busy and being, you know, you, you need to relate to people that you're am amused by their own way of working and their dreams and the quality of uh, their knowledge and, and what God gave the, them. You know, you have people that they like Juani. Juani is not a, only a person who travels uh, Argentina finding products. Everybody can do that. It's a person that is so welcoming and so that these producers that they were probably tired of talking to people and not being paid the, um, the, the, the right money or not having this long-term relationship, they were tired. So, but Juan, he got that, that blessing that allowed him to, to come into these houses, start a relationship. And of course we try a few different qualities of Sherba Mate and this family was not only the, the human side, but also the, the what they produce. Because at the, at the end of the day, I believe that the energy of the universe and this land give us wonderful things without any doubt. But if that energy and work by hands of people that they have the same energy and the quality, that product is going to be much better also. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's perfect. And what do you see going forward for a Floridia in terms of sustainability? I don't know. I mean, we organized one of the biggest uh, sustainability festivals in, in the world called Festival Atlantico. It's been our third edition last year. We were two editions that we couldn't make because of the pandemic. And this uh, fourth one is going to be in Ushuaia, in the, in Patagonia, in the deep south of the world, because it's the last little piece of the world. And I, I like to invite friends and talented people to come to my country and not only show them Buenos Aires, because it's another city. It's beautiful, but uh, the country is so wild and, and uh, big. So last year we did in the, the north next to Bolivia in the Andes. This year we're going to be in deep south in the ocean in Ushuaia. And what basically we do is we try to expose not only the knowledge of the people that are coming from abroad with all the technology or the different way of working and presenting what they do regarding to sustainability, but we give a lot of space to local producers that they also present their cases. And uh, our native towns, Aboriginal people, and producers that they've been working that land for ages. And this is called a sustainable festival, but it's not, then again, it's more a human, it's a humanitarian festival. We all, we all end up crying the last one uh, and so many beautiful talks. I tried not to, to involve technology. So I asked them everyone not to have any screen, no projections. And that's it. It's you talking like the Greeks under a sky and uh, in an open air and I remember Kelsey Ramage, she did an amazing presentation about humanity and how she felt and how she was affected by the pandemic. And, and that's also sustainable. And Nat and Yang, for example, he told me, I mean, I'm not very sustainable in my bar. I say, yes, you are Nat, because you give a space to a lot of people. You train the people, you give them a way of growing. So that's also sustainability. So please come and talk about that. This year, uh, Gabe uh, Orta from Broken Shaker and Christine, they're going to come and, and they're going to uh, talk about health and uh, nurturing and how you can be in this industry and being connected to, to what surrounds you. So I believe it's sustainability. We understand it basically in a very small way, but at the end of the day, it's a way of living, no? Because it affects everything. Absolutely. That's so great. Well, thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me. Thank you very much. I hope to see you in Argentina. Hopefully, yes, or in London. Or in London. Looking forward. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Sure. The Little Red Door in Paris has been wowing them since it opened in 2013. For the last three years, they have made farm to glass their cri de guerre, which means they work directly with French producers. Alex Francis, the director of bars, is here to explain how this works. 
I'm Alex Francis. I'm the director of bars for Bonamy Group, which includes a little red door in Paris. Great. And so what are you doing here at the Paradigos Sustainability Summit? So Little Red Door it was one of the, the four bars here that was the recipient of the Kettle One Sustainable Bar Award. We work farm to glass, which means we work directly with French producers to both not only source their produce, but then within the guest experience, we center the drinks around them and a variety of their produce. And we spoke about how that works as a business model, as well as how that's been across the last three years, the presentation that we gave is, is more of a shared learning of how we found it was rather than necessarily a, a codex of how you should live your life. It's more about here's all the mistakes we made and here's what we think you might not want to do in the future. And here's all the unexpected benefits that we received along the way. And you talked about specific cocktails and broke it down. Um, mm. Could you pick one of those cocktails and yeah. talk me through the process as an example of right. For sustainability. Absolutely. So with each of the drinks, we would break down, you know, who the producer was, what that journey with working with them was like, and then how did this end up manifesting itself as a drink? Because for us, a little red door had previously been known as conceptual cocktail bar. And so for us, that drink part of it, creating interesting and engaging drinks was for us felt the most straightforward and the simplest part is actually, how do you do all the work beforehand to get there? And so when we started out on working farm to glass, there were aspirations that we weren't able to fulfill straight away, whether it's financially, whether we didn't have the experience, whether we didn't think our guests were necessarily engaged in the right way to be able to receive those. So for example, with Walnut, when we started working with Walnut, the first challenge with our menu grounded was how do we convince these producers to sell to us? Because to be honest, most of them don't know what a cocktail bar really is. Most of them are suspicious of someone from Paris, specifically in the case of myself, a British person in Paris, ringing them up and saying, we want to buy your Walnuts. And then they are a little bit wary of what you want to do with their name. The French farmers and AOPs are very, very protective about intellectual property. And so specifically when you want to work with protected and culturally important products, you have to a lot of kind of relationships to navigate. So grounded, it started off with us just buying what they already made. We made a very simple walnut shrub. So we took worn dried walnuts. We added that to sugar. We added some walnut vinegar, and this was the base of the drink and the drink was not too dissimilar to the next two iterations of it, which was essentially somewhere between a spritz and Lambrusco with heavy walnut flavors. So in the first one, it was with, with the first two were with whiskey. The middle one with Flourish was a stepping stone it was developing those relationships and, and it was scaling. Flourish was the name of your man. Exactly. Okay. So you have Grounded, Flourish and Evergreen were the three. Evergreen okay. came out last week and then Flourish the year before and Grounded came out just after COVID. And along that relationship of working with the walnut producers, we realized that the AOP was so heavily protective of the style of walnuts and the aesthetic of them, that there were many that they sold much cheaper for confectionery. And so what we did is we worked with them to source that because we didn't need beautiful walnuts. And what actually the benefit of that was in that menu, we were able to garnish with a fully beautiful AOP green walnut I say we're um, dried walnut because we had the margin now to actually be able to show the whole product as well as put it into the drink. But all of this was more the aspiration in the first place was we wanted to make green walnut wine. The reason the drink looked like a spritz in Lambrusco was because there's a quite famous product within France called Noir Saint-Jean. And it's a green walnut wine. It's made on Saint-Jean day in June. And it's green walnuts infused into sugar and red wine. And it's delicious. And we thought, you know, what's missing from that though, is we want it a little bit less boozy because it's a, it's a quite high ABV fortified wine, about 18, 19%. But also it'd be really delicious on tap carbonated. And so it's similar to just buying that and watering it down. And like, why don't we make our own and we can shape that. But there were two problems was the first one, like I said, for grounded was how do you buy from these people? Because they don't just sell green walnuts. Actually the people we spoke to was said, why, why would we sell you green walnuts? We, we, we charge you so much for dried walnuts. Why would we bother doing any additional work for you there? And then also what, how do you go about making it? You know, you need to buy the green walnuts in one go within grounded all of the menu we sourced through the season. So the menu launched at the beginning of the season and lasted for the entire time and we built up the stock along the way. Flourish four of the six ingredients were dried goods and the other six ingredients we sourced in bulk within the season. So green walnuts uh, this year we received in June and then we sat on them for eight months and we infused them into Marc de Bourgogne, which is a distillate of the lees you make from when it's from Burgundy. It's the lees after the winemaking process. They still have a lot of alcohol and flavor in them. 
they then get distilled again. It's a very traditional spirit making process in all the famous areas of France. So you have Mar de Bourgogne, Mar de Gaud, Verstramino, Mar de Alsace, etc. So that's what we did. We waited for eight months. We infused for eight months. We infused 250 kilograms of green walnuts into 300 liters of barrel from Mar de Bourgogne. And then about a month ago, we decanted that and we added it into a thousand liters of single vineyard, single harvest red wine, harvest from Languedoc last year. That was the original idea. That was the original dream of what if we made our own green or wine, walnut wine, we've now kegged it. We now, we basically, uh, it's ready to go. That's the whole year's work done. And also from a business point of view, it's really nice to be able to compartmentalize all your prep into these big projects that are very labor and time intensive, but very rewarding and actually streamline the day-to-day of the business, which is incredibly important at Little Red Door because we're so busy for a very small bar. And so within that one drink that's been on all three menus, you have a story of how we figured out as we went, how would we reach our own goals of working without packaging directly with craft producers. So there aren't a single, there isn't a big, single big brand on the menu. 95% of the ingredients are in bulk. When I say in bulk, that means they're either in a huge thousand liter containers, like the red wine, or they're in recyclable, non-single use plastic containers like jerry cans, bagging boxes, and things like that. The only three things that aren't were two wines we found during the cocktail development process. And the only reason they're not in bulk is because the whole harvest was already bottled. So if we wanted that, it would have been less sustainable to take it out of bottles. And then the only one was a a gin brand, which is currently developing. And the brands within that all worked with us over three years. We kept telling them we need it to be in bulk. We need it to be bulk. And some of them, you know, in grounded, they already had the solution. They were already doing eco spirits and stuff like that. Some of them were so small, they were right around the corner and they were like, yeah, we'll put it in whatever you want. We don't care. And then there were the small to medium sized brands that actually had, you know, fulfillment already set up and they had stock with sitting in warehouses and we could have been really precious and very, very demanding of those brands and say to them, no, you need to change now. But much like we're a small business figuring this out, we realize they're small businesses figuring out their issues. And so we worked with a lot of them. And now all of those brands that we work with the past three menus do do bulk. Most of them did in the beginning. And it's using the menu and, the, and that individual drink as a motivator for them saying like, look, we want to keep working with you, but we need you to come along with it. And it's actually one of the things that you see when you work with someone like B Corp. So we're in the process of being B Corp certified. And when you go through with that, if you look at the, the standards they uphold, one of the criticisms often people will say is that, oh, it's very loose. You know, they're, they're very vague. It's very non-committal in certain areas, which I think is a misunderstanding of how problematic some large businesses are and why they don't meet those standards. But also B Corp are very clear in saying this is a commitment to develop over time. They're very clear that if you get into B Corp this year, next year, the standards are going to be a bit tighter. And the year after they're going to be a bit tighter because this is the trend and we want to make sure that we're moving with that. And we're not seen as a very generic organic certified which can mean so many different things to so many different people. They said, we want it to be a standard. And so we really re- kind of reflect that in the way we work with our, pro- our craft brands, all the spirits that go into that. We also do all of it with no formal contracts. There's no agreement. Everything is based on, you have the opportunity. We, regardless of whether we have an agreement or anything, we're going to list you. You're going to be on this menu because we like your product. That's the main reason, the only motivator for anything in the Little Red Door menu, because we like the product. And what we, through that, we've developed this network of producers. So the farmers around us, we've developed a really amazing team and we've developed a group of small brands that have come along this journey with us. And do you foresee doing it in this way? Mm-hmm. I guess for, I'm saying the word foresee a lot, but for the foreseeable future, yeah. you intend to continue in this Yeah. Way? So Evergreen Flourish and Grounded was always a, a project around putting this into people's minds. So we knew that we were almost going to labor the porn a little bit when it came to our marketing list. Everyone like, we get jokes now, but people say like, yeah, we get it. You like farms. But this was the whole idea was to, to really show people. I know these are the people we didn't want to do it as a really tokenistic one menu that right. flew away. Like I said, there's also like a lot of work we need to do internally to actually be able to do this in the way that we saw appropriate. The future is not going to look exactly like evergreen. But the thing that will change is the bit that we present to the guests. The fundamental way that the business was will continue to be like this forever. Because for us, we find it as the most rewarding way to make drinks, the most rewarding way to work. And we found that it resonates with guests and other bars in a way that 
not many concepts that we've ever done have. And so for us, the idea or the hope is now that we stop having to say that and people know that and they assume it when they see it. And we can have those conversations with people about other things that go beyond just the producer. And we can look at wider topics around, you know, the effect of climate change in, in northern southern France, look at the, at the depletion of water in the, in the southeast or the fact that the northwest is sinking into the channel and, and all of these other topics that are more specific. And I think that if we tried to tackle them three years ago or tried to speak to our guests about them, we maybe would have come across as a bit gimmicky. Whereas now, because people are aware we have this network of producers and aware that we have this capacity internally to, to genuinely collaborate with these people, that maybe we're a little bit better placed now because we, we always see our role as the advocate for this whole system. We don't really see ourselves at the center of it for us. The guest is at the center and we're just the final ring around them that brings all of these different influences to the table. And so we, we kind of see that as also a responsibility to advocate more for wider issues. That was fabulous. Thank you so much. And it was not only that, but the cocktails tasted it. Well, so it was much. great to be able to try the main, mm. a little bit of the main, the first week. Yeah. Launch, which is super exciting. Here. Very we, deep. One of the things that I find funny over the last year, we've, we've had it a lot where a lot of people have seen what we do. And <laughs> they, they happened again yesterday where people came up and were like, I was so happy I liked the drinks. Um, and I'm, I'm, like, I'm, I'm glad you like them, but I'm also, I find it so funny that people in their mind, they're like, this seems like such a nice idea. I really want it to work. I wish I had the apple on tap and no, I always end with my top tip for the whole bartender. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could kind of transform that into the top sustainable tip yeah. for the whole bartender. Would you? So, but when it comes to doing anything at home, I think one of the things that we see the most with the work in the bar is that we, you realize very quickly that people are very removed from the agricultural base, which we all live on. Whether it's bars, restaurants, the home consumer, you know, if you eat prepackaged pasta, the flour comes from a field at some point, you know? And so what we always talk about, if you're doing things at home is to have that connection again. And the main way for us is seasonality. People are so used now to going to supermarkets and seeing the same 10 staple fruits and veg that they become repetitive. And then one of the biggest complaints people have is life satisfaction because they're not engaged because they're eating the same foods. They have the same routine and things can be very stodgy. And, and for us, we always say, well, one, just look what's in season. And if you can't get it at your convenience store, because obviously not everybody has loads of time to be wandering around markets all the time, but try and find places you can get. Also, because at the moment you start going to those markets or going out to those, you know, you start connecting with real people. Because there's a real person selling them. It's not a self-service checkout. And then from that, you all of a sudden, what you're having to work with changes all the time. And when everything you're working with changes all the time, you are motivated to learn more and do more. So you can't process things in quite the same way. And so you have to, you get driven to learn new techniques and new preservation and, and all these things that are the things that people really get excited about. You know, you spend so much time at home cooking way more than you need to, you know, you know, one cooks like a chef at home, you spend your whole afternoon doing one dish. And so going and finding like, oh, right now, the only thing that's in season is squash. And you go, well, that seems weird. How would I do that in a drink? And, but if you Google squash cordial, you'll find 20 bars around the world have a recipe of how to make a cordial from that. And just look away of converting that into a liquid. And then you've got your really exciting, really different thing. And then what's really lovely with that is the the more these things you build up, because then you start making this pantry, which is essentially a back bar of these ingredients from all through the year, is they build it really quickly because you can't drink all of it yourself. And then all of a sudden you have a really great excuse to have to bring it to a friend's house or create an occasion at home to have these things. And all of a sudden you see the food and drink, especially that you see in the Mediterranean, becomes so key to social life that I think in a, a specifically in the UK, the US, and uh, some parts of Northern Europe, there's that, the, the, we've lost a little bit of that. We've lost that connection because everything has become kind of automized and really fast and, and just slowing down and, and spending a little bit too long at the market and getting to know what's in season and what grows around you is so important. That's a great tip. I love it. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sitting down and talking to me and I'll see you in Paris. See you in Paris. We end now with Dennis Thompson the Global Relationships Director for the Nolet Distillery and Kettle One Vodka to explain how and why they got involved 
with the Paradiso Sustainability Summit and the importance of their Garnished for Good program. So I'm Dennis Thompson. I'm uh, the Global Relationships Director for the Nolet Distillery in Schiedam, the Netherlands. So I work on Kettle One Vodka. I work for uh, quite a small family business that is here for the last 333 years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we met at the Paradiso Sustainability Summit. And I was wondering if you could tell me what you were doing there and um, your Garnish for Good program. Yeah. But to, to explain that a little better, I want to bring you back to uh, 2017, if you don't mind. Uh, Bob Nolet and I, at the 11th generation, uh, we traveled to uh, Mexico City for the world class finals in 2017. There's about, in that year, there were about 54 or 55 countries competing. So it's, it's, it's quite a nice overview of what, what's happening around the world. So there was this Max story and um, Max Ego was about, okay, what could bartenders do about sustainability? Now, I think from the 54 countries, there were about 53 talking about CO2 emissions. Um, but there was suddenly there was a bartender that was talking about nuggets of hope. Uh, he didn't call it like that, but it came across to me like that. And he talked about this, this hive. He drew a circle of seven kilometers around his bar. It's quite a simple setup. He drew a circle and then he tried to connect as many businesses together to buy produce or to get a really good honey. A very nice community driven thing. Both Bob Nolet and I were in the same room actually seeing this part of the competition. It's, the competition is for us super busy. We have to run yeah, all, all, all week around, of course, to do interviews and talk to as many people as possible. But for some reason, we were in the same room. And after the presentation, I walked over to Bob and I, I said, I think this is our answer. This is what we should do. Um, and, and Bob said, free your agenda. And this is the most important you are going to do from now on. Uh, and yeah, years later, I found myself in, in uh, Barcelona meeting you. Um, but that was mm -hmm. all started in, in Mexico, basically. Fantastic. Now, specifically, I guess you created this Garnish for Good program. Yeah. So first thing I did, so I waited till the end of the competition and I walked over to him. I said, uh, I loved what you were presenting. I want to know everything about it. And if you don't mind, I want to adopt it and make it a global phenomenon. You know, that was a promise. I said, I don't know what what will come out of it, but I will try. Uh, I do everything possible. Um, and he said, yeah, that would be fantastic. Probably half not believing me because there's so many people promising things, but it took us like a couple of years since 2017 to actually yeah. find a proper name. So how did you find out about what Paradiso was doing and why did you come on board with it? Yeah, so for a couple of years, uh, we... So we do the Carnage with Goods Incorporation together with different guides from three or four different years. You see amazing projects of, from all over the world, which, yeah, gives me a proud feeling. Actually, so in 2018 we did we did the first one for the Globals. It's something that comes every year, and every year there's the local finals. So bartenders have to start thinking about it. So before you know, let's say, like take a minimum, you have 50 different bartenders that do a little project. One of them wins their locals. Then that project will be bigger and then they go to the globals and then we pick a few that we actually uh, help uh, uh, to uh, to make bigger as well. So yeah, by, by now there's hundreds of nice, really nice bartender initiatives. Uh, we started with the uh, Best 50 Awards. Since five or six years, we call our prize uh, the Sustainability Prize. So that's why uh, it's, it's a quick connection. The guys from uh, Penicillin won it. A couple of years ago, the little door won it, and then Paradiso winning it. So, yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, then it comes together quite, uh, quite easily. I was wondering what you learned over the day that you were there that maybe was unexpected for you. Hmm. I don't know if we can talk about unexpected, but I was positively surprised by how much the team did. Uh, so from Paradiso, I was positively surprised that the drive of all the different five bars that were involved is on the subject. I walked away with a big smile, let's say. Uh, also, I think it's amazing. I could never have dreamt in 2017. And this is not because of us or any, in, in any shape or form, but I could have never dreamt that it would come to yeah, a bar basically taking the lead because that's how I felt about it. I was like, 
we need to do much more because if a bar can do this, what, you know, we are, yeah, we're behind. So, uh, I, I got a huge inspiration out of it. Uh, I totally agree. And I love the idea of the nuggets. That's so interesting because I felt that coming out of it, I had learned so much and I wished that kind of everyone in the world had been in the room with us to hear it. Because again, I felt like you, so surprised. And there was so much that I learned that I didn't expect to learn and, and how incredible these bars are doing to help try and save the planet. And um, I, it was uh, a joy to, I guess, see all the bars who had won your award were in that room. Yeah, there was also sort of an accident to, to, for, for us, of course, but it, it, yeah, it, it's super cool. Yeah, it's, it, the, the beauty of this is we just tell the bar to, bartenders to take a project and they're in the lead and, and they, they are also, in my mind, the most connected in their, in their community. So they know what to do. I don't know what uh, the bar in Hungary needs to do, but they do, and, and so on. So that's also, I think, the power of the whole whole matter. And one thing I want to add to the whole conversation is I also believe, and I said that in Barcelona in my speech, uh, is that bartenders, or at this level bartenders, they are as good as the best chefs around the world. Um, and they have the same, the same mindset and, and the same drive. Uh, and I think uh, we as a brand should help bartenders be awarded for that. I would say everybody go to differentsky.com and, and see what the bartenders did around the world because they do so much more than you think. Well, there'll definitely be a link, so don't worry about that. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. I have to give a huge thank you to everyone who participated in today's episode and an extra special thank you to Giacomo and Margarita and their entire team, including Bianca Grisolia and Manuela Greco for making me feel like family. You can find out everything you want about Paradiso at paradiso.cat. Plus, if you want to know more about Kettle One's Garnish for Good, check out differentsguy.com. Now, on to our cocktail of the week. Our cocktail of the week comes straight from Paradiso. It's on their new menu, and it's called The Cloud. You'll need a tumbler and a chunk of ice. Then add the following to your glass. 40 mils of Mezcal Union. 40 mils of Amaro. 10 mils of Fino Sherry infused with hibiscus. 20 mils of Xylitol Cordial, which I believe is like sugar syrup, but using Xylitol instead. And one Pipara which is a pepper. Top all of that with sparkling water and stir. Then as a garnish, add an asturtium leaf and a coffee cloud. What form that coffee cloud takes is in your hands. I can't say this is an easy recipe, but it is from Paradiso, the best bar in the world. You'll find this recipe and all the cocktails of the week at alushlifemanual.com where you'll find some of the ingredients in our shop. Makes you think, doesn't it? So if you live for Lush Life, make sure you head to the bars and restaurants you love and tell them how much you love them. The music for Lush Life is by Stephen Shapiro and used with permission. And Lush Life is always and will be forever produced by Evo Terra and Simpler Media Productions. Which leads me to say the wise words of Oscar Wilde, all things in moderation, including moderation, and always drink responsibly. Next time, we're with the women behind London Cocktail Week. Until then, bottoms up. Bottoms up.